all. Good morning. Thank you, worship team. Don't you love that? In every season, I say yes. Don't you love those words? Man. And we get to sit, we get to be here today and watch some people go through this. I've been able to, I was part of the other services, and man, we just have, like they said, 27 people making a profession of their of their faith today through baptism. What an incredible, incredible thing to be a part of. And um, you know, I think it's just really, really neat. I think. God demonstrates in so many ways the way he, the way he knows us. He, you might think sometimes, like, why do we, why do, we do the, the, the baptism thing? Well, it's, it's one of those things that God gave us to help us to remember the work that he's done in our life. It's more than just a concept. It's more than just a memory. It's an actual thing that we're a part of. You got you to gotta get in the water, right? You got to get wet. You have to, you have to have people help you get in and out. You don't think about some other things like when the person that's, that's baptizing them, they have to put their own hands in the water and get their own hands a little wet. People got to participate uh, in that. There's folks out there helping them get dry. There's people coming to celebrate with them, taking pictures. It's a whole thing with a lot of people that tell a story of what, of what God has done in their life. And for all of us in here who have been baptized at some other time, you're telling the same, the same story. But I just love the way that God gives us this, this tangible, tactical, group, fellowship thing to, to really burn into our heart and mind what he's done. Because we had to do something, we did it in front of people, and it's much harder to forget those things. Uh, I won't ask you to raise your hand, uh, but some of you have already started decorating for Christmas, okay? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, all right, because it just makes the rest of us feel horrible, okay? It just makes us feel bad, like we're just not quite there yet. And we're not, all right, I get it, uh, we're not. Uh, but I, I have a little bit of an advantage this year, not significant, and it's by no means planned or intentional. But I've already got all of my boxes out of the attic and, and they're already ready to go, And you're like, well, you just moved into your house, right? That's right. We just never actually put them up in the attic, okay? They just got landed in a bedroom somewhere because they thought, I'm not going to traipse these all up into the attic. In a few weeks, traipse them back down into into, uh, the the world of the decorating and the new house. So um, so we're we're in that. But I, I think about... And we have four kids too, all right? So four kids, uh, all, three of them are out of the house. One is a senior. And so you know we got a lot of Christmas ornaments, right? Okay. We've got a lot of paper plate snowmen, amen, right? We've got a lot of popsicle stick stars with glitter on them and pictures. And they're, they're wonderful, right? You heard me say that. They're wonderful, all right? But every once in a while, every couple of years, a few just make their way to another box. It's just another box, Pastor Craig. That's all it is. It's not any, you know, it's just another box that some of the, because we just can't keep everything. But when we, you know, when we're going through that stuff, um, it's, it's great because I, I, I feel particularly blessed because we're going to spend Christmas in a, in a new house. We just moved here a couple months ago. Some of you don't know this. Uh, and I always feel like the home is your home when you've spent Christmas there. That's so, I'm, I'm excited about that. But getting the decorations out, the cool thing about it is, you know, they obviously tell the story of Christmas, okay? But, but more than that, they don't just tell the story of, of Christmas and decorate your house now. They tell the story of the past. There's ornaments, there's pictures, there's all kinds of things through your house and not just through, not just through the Christmas season. There's things in your house and in your life that don't just point to what's happening right now, they point back. They point back to Christmas 2017 or the summer of 2008, You've got pictures of people that you don't live near anymore, pictures of people that have gone on to be with Jesus. And when you see those pictures, when you see those things, you see those mementos, they remind you of something else. They help you tell a story. They bring you back to that point where you go, "Ah, you know what, let me tell you about that. That was really cool. That was super funny. That was amazing. They help you to tell the story of what's been happening in your life, just like baptism over here. Uh, This morning, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 3. Last week, Pastor Craig started a series called Crossover. And it's challenging us and we're we're walking the road to some new areas in our church. We've got some new exciting things that are happening with us. And we're walking this road uh, alongside God's people through the story of Joshua. And last week, we, we explored and we saw how God began to set aside 
Joshua and really set them up for what was going to happen in the future. He began to tell them what he was going to do. You remember the, the Ark of the Covenant up on the screen that we had here? God was beginning to show them, look, this is what's going to happen. And here's where I'm going to take you. We're going to go into some new places. And believe me, these people, unlike the previous generation, these people were ready for it. These people were not, they weren't, they, they, it's not that they were unafraid. It's not that they didn't have any concerns, but they had clearly submitted those things to the Lord. They had clearly given those things over to God and they were ready to go. But remember, Joshua is one, is very unique. He's not just their leader. He's one of only two people in the camp that have actually been to the place that they're going. Rewind the tape 40 years ago. You, you probably remember the story. Joshua was one of the 12 spies that went into the land um, and they, they saw the great things. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey, fertile ground, lots of space, lots of great things. I mean, it's an amazing place uh, to live, amazing place to be, but there's some, there's some pretty uh, intimidating things there, right? There's giants, there's big cities, there's fortified walls, and although it would be really great if we could be there, I mean, they've got awesome, they got jumbotron screens over there built up. Nobody even knew what that was. They already got it, okay? All right, they didn't really have that. I'm just, just playing here with you, all right? But they, they've got all this stuff, but we, we can't do that. And Joshua was a part of that group. He was the, one of the two that said we should go. Everybody else said no. And so for 40 years, Joshua had to live with the memory or the thought of what could have been. And so standing here today, at, or this day at the Jordan River, Joshua knows here we, here we are again. It's a different story. It's a different group of people. It's going to be a different ending. But this time Joshua doesn't just have to go back. He's not just being called to, to go back and experience it again. He's being called to go back and watch this, to lead his people with him. He's called to not just walk the journey that he went to before to go back down memory lane. No, he's called now. This time, Joshua, I want you to go back and you got to bring everybody with you. You're going to create some new stories, Joshua. You're going to create some whole new legacies and I need you to bring them with you today. I think um, what we have to remember, what we have to see, what we have to just understand is that God is wanting to do some things in your life. He's wanting to do some things in my life. And he's wanting to take us to some places that, that only he knows about. But it's, here's the deal. It's not just about you. It's not just about what God's done in your life. It's also about how he's going to use you to impact others. And God was setting these people up for all that they would be doing. And they would have to have perseverance. They would have to, to, to walk with him. And, but I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think about the vision, when I think about the, the things that God has for me, when I hear things like that, when I hear about, you know, hey, God's wanting you to do, it's, it can be a little bit intimidating, right? I think, well, what, how, how am I going to do this kind of great stuff? Well, here's the deal. You don't have to create it. You don't have to be the one. Spoiler alert for the message today. You and I are not the Joshua of the story. Oh, don't get me wrong. It's not that God's not going to call you to do great things. It's not that he's not going to call you to be bold and courageous as Joshua was. It's not that he's not going to call you to step out in faith and to lead out and to change. and sac No, no, no. It's not that. It's just that you don't have to be the one that comes up with everything. You don't have to be the one to create the whole plan. What he calls me and you to do is simply follow Jesus into the land that he's called us to be in. And, I, and that for me is a great comfort. Sometimes it feels like I've got to create it. Sometimes it feels like I'm the one sitting on the edge and going, all right, God, we got this big task and I got to, I got to be smart enough. I have to be capable enough. I have to be, you know, to work hard and have to, I have to do all this kind of stuff to create the thing that you want to do. And sometimes I feel that way often because the reality is, is I'm just not listening to Jesus close enough. I have this idea, this heroic idea of my role and God's saying today, no, 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 no. You got to step out in faith. But listen, I'm, I've got the plan. I've got what's going on. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 3. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 3, verse 14 through, and we're going to read through chapter 4, verse 7. So if you have your Bible, turn to Joshua chapter 3, starting in verse 14. This is the word of God. Now, God has already told Joshua all the things that's going to happen. He's already laid the plan out for him. 
He's already told him about the Ark of the Covenant. He's already said, that, look, the priests are going to put the Ark on the poles. They're going to walk into the river. The river's going to part. The people are going to walk through on dry land. You kind of go through this scenario several times because you have God telling Joshua, Joshua telling the people, and then the people recounting the story again. It kind of just keeps telling the story. So they've already heard the plan. So in verse 14, they're ready to go. Chapter 3. When the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. But as soon as the priests carrying the Ark reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water at its edge and the water flowing downstream stood still, rising up in a mass that extended as far as Adam, a city next to Zarethan. The water flowing downstream into the Sea of Arabah, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off and the people crossed opposite Jericho. The pre yeah, that Jericho, that's going to come back. The priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Chapter 4, verse 1. After the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, choose 12 men from among uh, from the people, one man from each tribe and command them, take 12 stones from this place in the middle of the Jordan where the priests are standing. Carry them with you and set them down at the place where you spend the night. So Joshua summoned the 12 men he had selected from the Israelites, one man from each tribe and said to them, go across to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you lift a stone onto his shoulder, one for each of the Israelite tribes so that this will be a sign among you in the future when your children ask you what do these stones mean to you you should tell them the water of the Jordan was cut off in front of the ark of the Lord's covenant when it crossed the Jordan the Jordan's water was cut off therefore these stones will always be a memorial for the Israelites so they've moved, they're taking, they're taking the steps, they are in process and everything has happened just the way God told Joshua it would and just the way Joshua told the people it would. The priest put the ark up on the poles, they went out there, they touched the food on the water, the water went back, the water you know, w uh, went south and, and stopped flowing into the sea, they went out into the middle of the river bed and then the whole nation passed in. It's probably a long day. Then they probably, I don't know how long it took them to do it. We don't really know. But the whole thing went exactly the way that God said it would go. And so the, the thing for me is, is it's, it's amazing and it's wonderful to hear that God already had a plan. Now, I don't know about you, but this is probably not the plan that you and I would have come up with, okay? But let's look at exactly what happened in this passage. Let's look at the story and see how God is weaving into his people a story about his goodness, about himself, not just for them, but also for others in the region and for future generations. There's something that if you haven't heard anything from us at this church, I know that you've heard that we are all about making disciples. We are all about seeing lives changed and transformed. It's, it's an integral part of our new Cross Creek Network church planting uh, initiative about impacting lives to third, fourth generations and beyond. And that's exactly what God is laying down here for them. He's saying, listen, I want to give you a story, not just for you, not just for those in the area around you, but for people who are going to come long after you are gone. Let's look at what exactly happened. Number one, the first thing is God told them exactly how to cross the river and what would happen. He told them about the priest. He told them about the ark. He laid it all out for them. He told the people that, that all the people didn't go over. And then he said, but here's the thing. Once you're all over and it looks like everything's been accomplished, you're not done yet. Well, I, I thought the whole point was to get the people across the river. Yes, but once everybody's across the river, that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the plan. You see, if it had been my plan, um, if I would have had to come up with it, I don't know about you, but I probably would have got some people together. I mean, I, the only thing I could think of if I was them, I would think of, well, how are we going to get across this river? Well, let's, I guess let's build a bridge, right? Let's build a bridge. We could do that, you know? 
but I guess they've lived in tents for a long time. I don't know. Maybe they don't know anything about bridge building. I don't know. Maybe that's just not, not feasible for them. Maybe too many permits and codes. And by the time the contractors got involved, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe that, so clearly they scrapped that plan. All right. That makes sense, but we can't do that. We don't have six to 12 months to do that just for one bridge. So um, I, another option would be uh, they could just kind of wade through the water, right? They could just kind of swim across. All the men go, yeah, that'll work. All the moms and wives go, no, 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 that's a terrible plan, right? That's, look at somebody and say, that's a terrible plan, right? That's not a good plan. Well, that's all I got. Now, if you had come to the meeting that day and said, well, here's the plan. Here's what we're gonna, here's what we're gonna do. We believe that if we just take the Ark of the Covenant, one of our, you know, our, our precious prized possession and just have the priest kind of step out into the water, what, we, what we're gonna believe that God will do, let's just gonna ask God to do this. We're gonna ask God to just push the river apart like he did before. That would be great, except that was not a good plan for you and I to come up with, right? That's not a good plan if you came up with or if I came up with. But here's the thing. That's not the plan they came up with. That's the plan God came up with. And that's what he decided to do. Therefore, guess what? Really good plan at that point, right? Really good plan. And so that's exactly what happened. They step in, the waters part, they move through, all the people through, success, game over. No, not exactly because the final step of that is now we need 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes to stay back or walk back in or wherever, go over there where the priests are. And I need you to pick up a stone, not just a rock, he doesn't say, pick up a couple of stones, put them in your pocket and walk them. No, he says, pick up one stone and heft it up onto your shoulder. So we're talking about big stones here. We're talking about something that obviously a man could pick up and carry, but it would take a little bit of effort to carry. So you, you've picked up things like that before that are just really heavy. You kind of pick it up and you rest it right here on your hip bone. And then you kind of get your arms back around it a little bit. And you, gotta, and you heft it up there and you're making sure somebody doesn't, you, know, you don't fall a little bit. It's, it's got some weight to it. Might even scratch you a little bit. Might have scratched your shoulder up little evidence that you had, you had to put some work into this deal. And God says to tell Joshua, to tell the 12 men, go get 12 stones like that from the bottom of the riverbed, carry them across. And then I want you to build up a monument, a little tower from the stones there in the campground that you're going to be in tonight. That's what happened. The second thing is what happened. The second thing that happened is this. When they emerged from the river, when they crossed the Jordan, where were they? Well, they were real close to the border of Jericho. Yes, that Jericho. One of, the, one of the places that when they went in the first time and they said, this place is fortified, this place is, is huge. Eh, we don't. Yeah, one place just like that. And not only that, they had they, this, they, this whole parting the river thing and people going through a big long journey. You know, when you do something like that, it probably got around to other people in the area. It was no secret that this people, this large group of migrants, massive group of people were now parked out on the borders of Jericho. Um, they would need to know that God was on their side. They would need to know that God was working because now you're kind of sitting out there and you're vulnerable because guess what? When the river goes back, now you got the river behind you and he, he's not promising to part it if you go back, right? The river's just there now. There's no way back. So you got the river over here. You got the city of Jericho over there. Now you're going, okay, okay, God. All right, what's next? What's the next thing? But God is putting them in the position to say, I'm about to do something. I'm about to do something in you that's gonna be an incredible thing now. But not only now, it's gonna be something that you are gonna tell the story of for future generations as you pour back into the people that are gonna come after you, as you invest your life in other people, this is gonna become a part of the story. And when you walk across the river, I'm gonna do all the work. All you gotta do is step out there. There's gonna come a time when you're gonna face people who are opposing you. And so I need you to know that I'm with you. The third thing that, actually, that happened that we just see very objectively is that God led them to build the story of his faithfulness into their culture. 
verse 4, chap, uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, and then 21 through 24 is when they come back and they say, when the people come back, when your children come back and they ask you, what are these stones here for? What's the point of this? Then you tell the story. You tell the story about how God parted the water. You tell the story about how chapter 3, verse 10 says, the living God is among you and he will not fail. That's the story that you're going to tell. I, I think I, I, one of the things I love the most about Jesus is, and we were talking about this in our, in our staff here recently. I love the miracles, obviously, the teachings, clearly. But there's some things about Jesus that I just am fascinated with. And that's how he interacts with us as people. The things that he knows about us, the way he knows how to communicate with us, the simple things that he knows about the way he made us, the things that help us remember what God's done in our life, to help us to learn, to help us to experience him. And I think that's exactly what this is. The whole 12 stones thing that could have been, that could have been left off and the people would have made it across, mission accomplished. But God knew that you and I and these people would need something to help them remember. Just like when you go through the baptism waters, you don't just think about being baptized, you actually get wet. Other people around you get wet. They take pictures of it. Somebody helps you go in and you come up and you say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. There's, there's all these tangible things that happen. And God knew that his people would need something to help them tell the story. Talking about stories, I, this last week we were at our second annual Cross Creek Network Summit. It was amazing. I just, some of you saw the planters here uh, last week up here on the stage. It was a fantastic time just hearing the story of God's work in Africa and Europe and in the Middle East, North America, just all the places uh, that we have work. But, but just, if I'm just being real, I, I, I love hearing the stories of the churches, but I just love hearing the stories of the people too of the guys, of their families, of what God's doing in their life, how, how they're being blessed, how they're struggling, all these things that tell a story of what God's doing in their life. And hearing that from all over the world last week was just a nourishment to my soul. You're probably familiar by now, you've heard about our, our Cross Creek Network and you know that is our initiative to, to establish disciple-making church plants all around the world. And what we're really drilling down on is creating these network hubs that can be producers of, of disciple-making churches all over the world. And, and, and let's just it be, be uh, unclear. This is not us trying to franchise the Cross Creek Network name and put ourselves out there. It's not about that. It's about us being a part of building up Groups of people that will become living stones in places that it shouldn't be happening. You see, the story, the very first story that, that these stones tell, first of all, these stones tell the story. And the very first story that they tell is that these stones should not be here. Wait a minute. What, what are these stones doing here? Well, this is the story of what God of what God did. What do you mean what God did? I heard, I, 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 had, I heard about this thing a little bit, but I'm not really sure that, that I, I, is that that really happened? Yeah, and let me tell you why. Because these stones that are, that are right here, these stones used to be on the bottom of the river. You can't get these stones anymore. These stones don't belong here. They belong somewhere else that you can't even see anymore. Some of you and me in our lives, what God has done in our life it really doesn't belong there. There's really no explanation for it until somebody says, yeah, that's right. This doesn't belong here. This shouldn't be here. This shouldn't be working. But God did something. God did something. As we establish these network hubs all around the world, uh, whether it be in, in, in Madrid or, or Israel or Burkina Faso or Zambia or wherever, uh, it, that's our testimony is that, yeah, this shouldn't be happening here. But God has done something. These living stones, these testimonies of who he is, telling the story of transformation all throughout the world, all throughout every corner of the globe. These, sto these stones tell a story, but I think they tell two stories. They tell the most obvious story, which is the miracle of the river, the miracle of what God did in that place. But they also tell the story of something else. They tell the story not just of what God did, but they tell the story of who was there. Each one of those stones has a, has a tribe's name on it. There was a guy who picked up the stone and carried it over here. There's somebody that did that. There's people whose 
grandma was a part of that group and whose, and whose family was there. And my grandfather knew that. And there's a people that are associated with those stones. Many of you have stories. You have God's stories to tell. My question to you this morning is, are you telling them? It's great to amen that, go, yes, yes. But are you telling those stories? Are you making the point to put the stones over here and say, this is what this is? Because you know what's gonna happen? One of these days, every one of us in this room is gonna be gone. And the story of what God's done in your life and mine will be gone as well if we haven't poured it into somebody else. If we haven't invested that life into somebody else. The stones tell a story. The second thing I want you to, to see and, and us to think about is these stones will live beyond you. You notice what he says, when future generations come, those stones are gonna be around long after they're gone. They're not even gonna stay there right where the stones are, right? They're not gonna live there forever. They're gonna move on. But that, but that monument to what God did is gonna be there. And if you know anything about rocks, those rocks are probably going to outlive the people that put them up. I've got rocks. I've got a rock in particular uh, that, we, that we took from, that I took from the French River, French Creek, French Creek River is what it's called, in just outside of Riggins, Idaho, about five years ago. My wife and I were up there and uh, just spending some time with the Lord. And um, God did some great work in our life and just really nailed down some scriptures in our hearts and, and spoke to us in some very deep and meaningful ways. And so I, I brought a, a, a rock from the riverbed that was right near the place we were staying and put it in, our, in, in the yard outside. It was too big to put on the windowsill. Okay, it's about this big, all right? It would have been nice to put it on the windowsill, but it's too big for that, all right? And it was too big for me to bring in here today. It's just too heavy. If I dropped it, wouldn't be good. It might hurt the stage. So, um, but I would look at that. Every time I would look at that rock, I would remember. I remember what God did. And just, if, just to be totally real, there are times that I would forget. There are many times that I, that I would walk by it out, outside in the backyard and like, I, you know, I see it and, and just mow the grass or do whatever I'm doing. But there would be other times that God would arrest my attention and I would look at that rock and I would have to go, that's what he did. I brought that rock to, uh, to our new, ho new house here. And so if you ever come to our house, you go in the backyard, it's, it's out there in the mulch bed. That white river rock that's, that means something to me. It tells a story. And, uh, and it's gonna live beyond me to future, future generations, to other people. I guarantee you that rock's gonna be around a lot longer than I am. And so is your story of God's testimony and God's faithfulness if we make a point to put it down. See, that's the third thing. The third thing is these stones, they don't build themselves. God did not build the stones up by some miraculous act of, you know, he, he could have just lifted the stones up out of the water. I mean, he stopped the whole river, right? He could have done this. He didn't just lift the stones up out of the ground and levitate them over to the campground and drop them there in a pile and build them up into some ornate thing. That's not what he did. No, he said, no, 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 you have to do this. You have to walk back over there. You have to get down. You have to pick up the stone. You have to maybe, you know, brace it a little bit, put it on your shoulder. Maybe it's going to scratch your shoulder a little bit. I don't know what it, I don't know. You're going to have to come over here. You guys got to put it in the campground. You got to decide, well, how are we going to build it up? You got to do all that. You have to put in the work. We have to put in the work of making sure our story gets told. And that's, that's, a, that's a troubling thing to me when I think about all the things that God's done in my life that I've not shared with anybody, all the things that I've not written down, all the things that my kids don't know about, all the stories that, that I, can't, I can't articulate them the way I used to. I don't want to miss any more. And I know you don't want to miss any more. And so I want to encourage you this morning, find the stones and start building. Start investing in somebody. Start telling them the story. It might be for you, it might mean writing in a journal. Maybe you write it in a Bible. Maybe you just take some pictures. Maybe you find a rock. Some, I don't know. Something tangible that you can point to and say, let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you why that thing's special. Let me tell you why that means something to me and why it's even here. Things that matter, things that make a difference. I've got stuff in our household that means something to me. There's pictures that are awesome. 
pictures that mean something. We found some pictures the other day from about 10 to 15 years ago. And I just, you know, I'm at the age now where I just start bawling. You know, I just got to see these pictures of little kids, my kids, and I just, I just kind of lose it. That's what I do. Also, um, I don't, I don't start, I don't get weepy, but I get equally emotional. You know, I love coffee. All right, I don't know if you any coffee fans in here. Okay, coffee. So I have some special coffee cups that, that when you come to our house, if you get one of these coffee cups, you're going to go, what is this? Like this, this is not, this is not nice. My wife kind of, uh, she, she just sort of like uh, gives it over to me because she would have everything just be nice and, and perfect and uniform and all that. Where me, I have cups from Walmart in Wyoming that I bought when I was on a trip to Wyoming. That's what I love, right? But it reminds me of something. It reminds me of what happened there. It, it makes me go back in that moment in time and deal with it in that, in that, in that season. But you got to build it. The fourth thing is these stones show a new life. These stones show a new life. You see, for a lot of us in here today, the problem for us is the wrong stories keep playing in your mind. You're running the wrong stories and they're on playback loop. And for many of us, the older we get, the deeper those stories get and it gets harder and harder for us to think anything else. We're believing the wrong things about God and many of us are believing the wrong things about ourselves. We're telling ourselves a story, you can't do that or you're telling the stuff a story, I don't need that, whatever that may be. But we're landing here today and going, man, I need to do something different in my life. But first thing is you gotta change the story of what's running through. Change the story of what, God, of what, what you're seeing every single day. And many of us just don't believe. We just don't really believe what Joshua chapter three, verse 10 says, that the living God is among you and he will not fail. Too many of us believe, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I would never say that, but I'm not living that. Failure is just kind of part of who I am. That's all I feel like I am is a failure today. The people of God who were there that day at the river, there were so many great reasons why they could have walked away. There were so many great reasons why they could have stopped and just said, you know, this really is not a good idea. I mean, Joshua, we have come long, far enough. I mean, people love you. People love the Lord. We are passionate about this deal. I mean, this is a great group of people right here. This is a great culture. Why don't we just do this? That river is, it's, uh, you know, it's not impassable, but let's just figure out a plan and maybe just stay here and, uh, uh, and, 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 and not really, not, not, not test this thing. Let's just regroup a little bit. And by the way, Jericho, uh, uh, that's, that's a big deal. And let's do another thing, Joshua. Let's just kind of go, keep it on the down low, this great nation thing. You know, they heard this stuff from, uh, from Abraham from years and years and years. You see, I think it would have been easy to do that and people would have said, look, makes total sense. Let's just stop. But they would have forgotten who God is and they would have forgotten who he called them to be. I wonder today if for some of us, if we're not investing our life, if we're not charging in a new territory, if we're not following Jesus, because we've begun to believe the wrong things about God and believe the wrong things about who he's called us to be. This morning, my encouragement to you, my challenge to you, as we look in the story of Joshua and we look in the story of the people crossing over, is that you would grab hold of the stories that God is doing in your life, that you would search them out, that you would ask God to do something and begin to put down these things in place, put down the stones in place in your life that can tell that same story to somebody else. Pass it along, make disciples, invest in other people. For some of you here this morning, you, you, you're not putting down any stones because there's no story yet. The truth is you really haven't given your life to Christ yet. You haven't given your life to Jesus yet. It's just, it's not a reality for you yet. And today is the day. Today is the day you say, you know what? I'm gonna put my full faith in Jesus. We wanna give you an opportunity to do that. If you would, just bow your head and close your eyes where you are. Bow your head and close your eyes if you would. If you're here this morning and you say, you know, I don't, I don't really have, I don't have the story that could be put into these, to a stone like this. I, I, I want that. But the truth is I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never actually surrendered my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm in church, I like what's going on, but I've never fully surrendered my life to Jesus. But today is the day. If that's you, 
If you're saying today, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time, I want you to just raise your hand wherever you are. Just raise your hand. Say, I want to follow him. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want him to write a new story about me. All right. If that's you, if you raise your hand or even if you didn't, but God put this on your heart, I want you to just join me and say in this prayer, repeat this prayer with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I know that I'm a, I'm a sinner, that I've, that I've fallen short of what you've called us to be, but I know that Jesus Christ died for me, that Jesus gave his life for me. I accept his death on my behalf and I seek today to follow him with the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, you pr- I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, what I want to encourage you to do is before you leave today, we're going to, te- we're going to give you some instructions on how to tell us about that. We'd love to walk with you that, through that. Because I believe God is wanting to tell the story of his goodness and his faithfulness through you and through me. I believe he wants to do that where you live, your family, your neighborhood, your workplace, all over the place. And he's got great stories to tell through you if we'll give our lives 100% to him.